What's up, guys? What's up? Oh man, we got some comments already. What's up? We got Howard. We got Little Tuna Roll. Awesome. What's up, guys? Welcome back to tonight's uh, uh, shark study party. We've got the brown banded uh, bamboo shark, um, and it's awesome. Uh, yes, I, I definitely agree. Little Tuna Roll. The art is fantastic. So thank you, Howard, for this beautiful picture of a uh, juvenile brown banded bamboo shark. So this is gonna be a really cool species to talk about. It's a very adorable species. Um, and also one that I don't know too, too much about. Uh, it is a kind of carpet shark. Uh, and it's also another kind of shark that is able to walk on the seafloor, uh, which I did not know that about this species because I know that epaulette sharks do that. But this shark apparently does that. We have some really cool footage to go over tonight uh, showing showing that. So it's pretty, uh, pretty exciting stuff. But hey, Howard, what's up? Hope you guys are doing well and had a good weekend. Um, so what's funny is I meant I made a comment at the top of the stream, and I also made a post in I guess YouTube's uh, community feature. Uh, we're supposed to have this amazing storm tonight, which has yet to appear. <laughs> like, so I'm, I'm happy. I, I was a little nervous that the stream was going to be jeopardized, but I think we're okay. Um, so, but it's it's crazy. Like the city was like like things are shut down i got like emergency notes like we have severe thunderstorms tonight or something and it's like nothing has happened yet and it's just like i don't i don't get it so if we this might be an interesting stream uh, as far as uh potential you know like first stream with a lot of thunder first stream losing power we'll see what happens but it's as far as i could tell completely clear right now so if this is another bust i, I just i'd be disappointed because i love i actually do love uh thunderstorms and rainstorms but anyway um, some really cool updates that I'm really excited about. Uh, we have, we're completely ready to go next week with Jess Myers and the Tiger Shark. So uh, Jess and I uh, were able to get together again this weekend and kind of uh, go over what we wanted to talk about. And uh, we kind of figured out, we had some, um, I for my stream setup, we had some technical difficulties and we were able to figure those out. But um, we're so down next week for the Tiger Shark. So this will be our second guest star stream. Uh, she and I are super, super pumped to talk about the Tiger Shark. And uh, she has a lot of cool personal stories about Tiger Sharks um, and a lot of cool insight to share uh, just about uh, ocean, um, like, like, like marine plastics, shark behavior, shark ecology. Jess has a really cool extensive career um, just in marine science in general. So this is, it's going to be a really awesome stream. Uh, and it's a great way to kick off Shark Week, because uh, I think Shark Week, uh, it's, it, like, I believe it does start, uh, does it start next week? I should actually know that. But um, it, we're in a Shark Week season. Like, July, all of July is basically Shark Week. It's basically Shark Month. But um, it's been raining, I just saw your comment, how it's been raining on and off here for two days. Wow, man. So, yeah, it's, it's like, here it's been a little strange because um, it's like we've had a lot of false alarms for storms like the past couple months where it's like forecast is like you know predicting it's like a lot happening and then it's now it's like yeah you know not as much not as much rain because like again like i love studying or like writing to storms so but we'll see we'll see what happens tonight apparently in the next hour is when it's supposed to explode so we'll see what happens but let's first dive in to uh, your art, and then we'll uh, take a look at some footage of the adorable brown banded bamboo shark. But Howard, this is awesome, and I actually really, I, I just noticed, I really love that you ha capture that detail of the uh, pectoral fins, um, where the shark is supporting itself on the fins. So, uh, like I said at the top of the stream, it is a uh, shark that walks on the seafloor. Um, so it is a shark that actually ambles around and is able to articulate its fins in such a way where it's literally like crawling on the seafloor which is it's a very interesting adaptation and i imagine it's a way to kind of help protect it um from predators in the water column so i imagine that's probably why and also to kind of like maybe wedge itself into crevices in its coral reef habitat so but uh i love that little detail and i love just kind of like like i can get a sense of like the mass or or, or kind of like like the depth um I, i'm not really using great artistic terms but like just like your shading and uh, your use of like light and shadow, I just I can feel like how kind of like 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 I can feel the body of this this shark. So this is super cool. It's it's one of my favorites. So well done. Thank you so much for uh, sharing it for tonight. So I really really love this piece. Um, and again, this is the juvenile color pattern. So uh, juvenile brown banded bamboo sharks have a black and white 
or dark brown and white or and cream colored color pattern. And then as they age, the color pattern fades. So tonight's uh, footage is going to be kind of cool because it's arranged in a sequence. We've got a couple short clips and then a couple longer clips, um, starting with the juvenile stage and then um, kind of getting gradually to the adult stage. So, um, so let's go ahead and take a look. Um, and here's a really cool uh, kind of a quick glance at what these stages look like. So this is an awesome website. Um, we haven't we haven't uh, checked back in with it in a while, but this is Elasma Diver. Uh, so this is um, Andy Merck, uh, who's a very famous uh, shark photographer. Uh, this is an, a wonderful um, like uh, photo collection of a, actually a really really uh, high biodiversity of species. So including the brown band and bamboo shark. So on his website, uh, this is a nice showcase of the difference between the juvenile color pattern right here and then the adult color pattern, which is a lot more uniform, um, just a uniform brown shark. So, um, but it's actually cool. This is a somewhat distant-ish cousin of the nurse shark. It has like the characteristic barbels, just like a nurse shark, but nurse sharks and bamboo sharks are kind of in their own different families. Um, what is the bamboo shark family? Hemiskeliidae. So uh, bamboo sharks are Hemiskeliidae. Nurse sharks are Ginglimos stomatidae. So slightly different, but you know they're they're cousins, and you can see the overlap in features. But let's go ahead and check out a baby brown band and bamboo shark, and here we go. So, <laughs> and it's actually completely adorable. Look at him go. So. That's actually a really, really young uh, individual. So, um, and I actually love, there's a lot of footage on YouTube that are like captive bamboo sharks. And I've tried to stay away from that as much as possible because I think it's important to see as much as we can in terms of like how it interacts with the environment. But this is maybe one of the cutest sharks we've ever seen. Um, just really, it, it's so interesting. It's just like, so, it, it's been very, very, it's <laughs> I, I I thought that was like an interesting kind of behavior. Like it, it, it almost is like sniffing like <laughs> under under the rock. Like I mean, it's it's so odd to see because this is this is a marine animal and yet it's you know behaving so much like kind of like a terrestrial. Um, I mean, it's like walking and like sniffing under rocks. It's just I don't know. It's, it's quite adorable. And it's so like it's so ginger ginger with its steps too. Um, and this is kind of odd detail. I actually do love um, all these. You can kind of maybe see them, uh, these copepods uh, buzzing around this little guy. Um, so you, it, it, that was a nice tell that, yeah, this is not an aquarium. This is definitely a marine environment. So the color pattern is really interesting because I'm sure that's a, uh, a great way to camouflage itself. But it does remind me of a couple of like uh, sea snakes. Um, so I forget the name. I don't know if it's the like a certain kind of crate that has a similar black and white color pattern and I'd be kind of curious why the, that color pattern might be effective for a coral reef environment so but is an adorable adorable baby little shark hmm? let's see so got sharks of the world open here so these sharks actually do overlap with that kind of sea crate habitat uh, in northern Australia like tropical areas like the Great Barrier Reef which is cool and this is a nice clip from nature footage and here's a kind of a better view of it actually now it's kind of like <laughs> gaining a, a lot of speed and walking on the seafloor um, so this is cool. This definitely is, you know, very reminiscent of those epaulette sharks. Um, and I'm noticing. I don't know if this is just like an like a blotch, but it almost looks like an uh, like an eye spot or an epaulette. Sorry, right here. I don't know if that's an extension of like the bar on its body, uh, or if that's an actual spot. So kind of like an epaulette shark. But let's see. So this guy likes coral reefs, tidal pools, tidal flats, reef faces, um, offshore to about 85 meters. So this is a completely sunlit zone species. Hides in crevices and under corals. Can survive out of water for up to half a day. Wow, did not know that. So, um, and I believe epaulette sharks do that too, uh, where they can 
Um, and it makes sense as far as like if this is occupying tidal pool habitat, um, you know, like the combination of being able to walk from maybe tide pool to tide pool and then also survive for a period of time out of water so that as the tide goes out, the shark is not in trouble. Uh, that actually makes sense. But it's really, really interesting. It's an interesting group. So this individual, I think this is still a baby, but I think it's a slightly larger. Do you know? Let's see. No, no, never mind. It's, it's just a complete baby. <laughs> this is cool. This is kind of doing walk, a mix of walking and swimming. And then doing that classic buccal pumping. So it's sitting on the seabed and actively pumping water over its gills. So nice contradiction to the myth that all sharks need to swim in order to breathe. Uh, not true for a lot of these carpet sharks. One thing I just noticed that's actually kind of cool about this species locomotion is if you compare, sorry, when it's walking, it's uh, really, in a straight line like like it's it, it's not really um there's not a lot of it's not a sinusoidal movement it's actually pretty direct and straightforward like just a, mi a minimum amount of like wriggling but when it's swimming or kind of doing this like gliding motion um you can kind of tell that uh see how much the body is ch like like how much the body is moving and how much it's going from side to side um kind of gaining momentum that's actually kind of interesting to see like like how um like as it's swimming it's much more like serpentine like more of a sinusoidal movement and then as it's walking it's much more direct um like in a straight line so cool species uh however i believe the those banded sea snakes are a deterrent to sharks interesting um that's actually that, i didn't know that that's actually really cool um let's see i'm actually i wonder if i can Sea crate. I'm so curious because there's there's a specific species that this one. This is the one. Oh, is it's literally no? Is it literally just called a sea crate? This is definitely the one I was thinking of. Um, the yellow-lipped sea crate. So that's 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 a really wild. This is a wild group. Like I, I, I mean, we we do not have sne uh, sea snakes here, so it's just like the idea of highly venomous snakes at sea is just like it's just kind of mind blowing to me. So yeah, it does look kind of the like, pattern looks kind of similar. It's just kind of interesting. So, so this individual um, is really cool. Like and subscribe to uh, Greg James. Actually, yeah, let's we'll shout out to these different pieces of footage. So there's nature footage. Um, I think we've seen a couple of nature footage clips before. There's Poseidon Dive Center. So definitely want to check that that channel out more. And then uh, Greg James Wade. Uh, and this is a super cool clip because this is actually more of an intermediary stage where you can still see the bands on this individual, but this is definitely a much larger individual and the color is fading. Um, so like the cream color is getting darker. The, the dark bands are actually kind of fading away and it's growing more into that uniform shape. Um, this is actually really cool seeing this uh, individual sort of walking, um, taking his sweet time <laughs> and near a seagrass habitat. So. And this is such a great example of like buccal pumping. So just, just you know, it's taking its time and it's like really actively just pumping seawater over its gills as it moves. So this is super cool. <laughs> That's an adorable face, actually. Okay, this is an extreme. This is a really, really cool looking shark. And uh, very active too. Like I know it's not moving. Uh, well, I mean, it is moving a lot. I know it's not like you know going in a specific direction, but like look at look at it looking. You know, like it's actively pumping water. Its eyes are actually rotating in a lot of different directions. Like, um, it's really actively engaging with its environment, which is pretty pretty interesting to see. <laughs> this is so cool, actually. This is such a weird. Um, it's just walking. 
One thing I'm really liking about this uh, species, by the way, is uh, the the two dorsal fins. Uh, they're pretty. They're uh, they're actually a bit sh more sharp looking than um, you would expect. Like I mean, I know they have like these rounded edges, but um, there's a bit of, there's a bit of like a kind of an indentation there that um, I think adds a lot of personality to the body profile. This is this is a really cool shark. <laughs> And now, he, now he's swimming. Well, I'm really glad we we're able to see uh, kind of like different life stages, um, and kind of. Oh my gosh, this is so cool. I love how the carpet sharks too, they have like, uh, vertical pupils, um, look at that face, um, it, it's almost kind of like a cat's eye, um, I mean, except a lot more extreme, you know, um, I believe rays kind of have a similar looking eye, but it's, it's actually on a horizontal plane, and then sharks have like, you know, or this kind of group of sharks, um, has that on a vertical plane, but this, this is absolutely gorgeous footage. And it's cool, like seeing that the the dorsal fins are pretty, you know, broad in comparison to the body size, but that caudal fin is very, very narrow. Um, oh, no ads. I don't want ads. So, da, 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 da. Um, this is even though this is an aquarium, um, I, I this is a public aquarium, the Greater Cleveland Aquarium. So I feel like probably okay to kind of maybe take a look at it because this is an, an adult um, brown banded bamboo shark and you can see like that final color phase of this species so this is just a complete you know this is so different from you know the juvenile phase uh, there are you can barely see the bands you can kind of you can kind of see them but like they're 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 really really faded at this point the dorsal fins are actually much sharper looking still um, and yet you still have that really small reduced uh, caudal fin an interesting, interesting species. Yeah, I know, I know, um, I think Roy Roy is probably at work, but I think he'd be freaking out if he saw these, so. Because <laughs> um, I know, I know Roy Roy likes the cute sharks uh, quite, quite a bit, so if he, if he's able to join later tonight, um, we, we need to replay um, a lot of this, so. I just noticed uh, the spiracles are very close to the eyes, uh, which is kind of a cool feature. Uh, <laughs> it's kind of so adorable. Also, this is kind of fun seeing him with uh, the bony fish uh, kind of at the top of the tank are lookdowns, which I believe lookdowns are an Atlantic species, and this is a Pacific species, so. Oh, this is interesting. Look how he's uh, kind of propped up on his pectoral fins. Look at that. This is kind of like uh, your uh, illustration, Howard. This is actually... Look at this. That is an interesting posture. Like the pectoral fins lifting the front half of the body up and then the pelvic fins um, still being grounded. That is actually a very... It's like a push-up. <laughs> this is very interesting. Wow. All right. I notice how the two rear gill slits are very close together. Oh yeah, let me, let, let's check that out. Um, I missed that. Oh, good call. Yeah, look at that. Yeah, that is really strange, actually. Look at that. Oh, wow. Good eye. Good eye. That is... That is... I wonder why that might be. That that's actually really really interesting because usually, wow, that is actually yeah. The, the the last two are extremely close. Uh, let's check out that older clip. Sorry, can I get out of this ad? Skip ads. Skip ads. Okay, there we go. I want to see because this was a larger individual. I'm gonna see, yeah. Look at that. Good eye, Howard. Oh, that is interesting. I wonder. Wow. I don't. I can't think of another shark like that, because um, pocket pocket sharks have like a weird orifice thing, kind of. I think around their pectoral fins, but that's the closest thing I can think of as far as like that. That is weird. 
Um, that is really, really interesting. Wow, I wonder, um, I wonder if uh, all Hemisciliads have this kind of arrangement, because I don't think... Let's see what else is a Hemisciliad. Oh yeah, Epilet Sharks. I think they actually are similar. Um, let's check that out really quick. Oh, a lot of them. Because I'm wondering if this is... I'm wondering if this is something that might distinguish the family. Because um, I don't think nurse sharks have this kind of feature. Uh, I'm trying to find a good picture. Uh... Because I was just checking out the Sharks of the World, like, diagnostic drawing, and it's kind of hard to tell. Um, one, two, three, four. Yeah, it's kind of similar. Yeah, you can kind of see it. Um, one, two, three, four, five. Yeah, the last two uh, uh, gill slits for... This is a member of the same family. The last two gill slits are actually extremely close together with epaulette sharks as well. That is really interesting, because, like, I'm sure... Uh, wait. Inunostomata serratum. I'm sure nurse sharks do not look like that, right? Oh! What? No, yeah, wait, one, two, three, well... Well, I don't know. This is, this is actually throwing me off. This is really interesting. Uh... Oh my gosh, wait. One, two, three, four, five. Whoa, hey, this is... Okay, no, this is something that's uh, happening with nurse sharks, too. The last two gill slits are actually very close together. One, two, three, four, five. Uh, let's check out whale sharks, actually. <laughs> um, is this something that's maybe going on with the order? I never noticed that before. Um, this is going to be really tricky since whale sharks are so spotty. Um, this might be a good photo. Hmm. One, two, three, four, five. It's kind of going on with whale sharks. I don't know if you can see that, but yeah, the last two gill slits are kind of close together on whale sharks, so there's more spacing with the first three. So maybe this is kind of something with um, Orlectoloboforms, maybe as a whole, which is kind of, I never noticed that before. So <laughs> that is actually really cool. Um, wow. Uh, yeah, let me... Uh... Let me star that, because like that is actually extremely cool. Like good, good eye, Howard. I I never ever noticed that before uh, about this order. So that is really cool. Wow. So all right. Well, we learned something new about Electrolova forms. Uh, that's actually pretty wild. So um, let's see. Oh, I just saw your comment. They assume that handstand position in aquaria while eating. So um, going back to the footage. Uh, with the the uh, push-ups, if you will. There we go. <laughs> Alright, this shark, I, I went into this not really knowing a lot about the species, and, you know, we're only, we're not even 30 minutes in, and it's like, it's already got a lot of personality. Like, this, that is so... What a character. So, <laughs> brown banded bamboo shark. Very interesting. So, all right, let's learn some more about uh, the biology of the species. Uh, and I do want to know how they're doing. So, let's just take a quick look at their conservation really quick. So, with the IUCN red list. Uh, and this, is, this is the same species, uh, Chiliscillium punctatum. Um, this is also known as the gray carpet shark. 
which is kind of an odd name because I think brown banded bamboo shark makes more sense. Um, just to make 100% sure, because uh, uh, Florida Museum of Natural History has a nice repertoire of English names. So, Trilosculium punctatum is the brown banded bamboo shark, also known as the brown spotted cat shark, which is not a good name. Brown banded bamboo shark, brown banded cat shark. If it's called a cat shark, it's not a good name because cat sharks are in such a completely different group. So, gray carpet shark and spotted cat shark. So, gray carpet shark, gray carpet shark, brown band and bamboo shark. Yeah, it's the same species, Chilisculium punctatum. So, it's annoying It's annoying that that's actually gray carpet shark and brown band and bamboo shark. Those are such, such different names, but what are you going to do? Um, but I hate it. I hate it when... Um, English names refer to a completely different group of sharks. Like these carpet sharks, they look, I know they look similar to cat sharks, but they're in a completely different line. Um, that happens with dogfish quite a lot too. There's a lot of sharks that should not be called dogfish that are actually mis misnamed dogfish. So, um, but yeah, what are you gonna do? So this species is near threatened. Uh, it lives in the Indo-Pacific, uh, the eastern coast of India, um, East Asia, and then northern Australia. And let's see. Oh, sorry. I think the status is, the assessment is over here. There we go. Just taking a drink of water. All right. This species is widely distributed and potentially fecund, <laughs> oviparous, tropical species occurring in a variety of habitats throughout its range. So it may, it sounds like based on that, it lays a lot of eggs. So this species is fish and retained through Southeast Asia. It's one of the most common species found in fish markets. It is susceptible to capturing a range of fishing gear and given its coastal preference, the distribution for the species largely overlaps with artisanal and commercial fisheries in many countries. Uh, but within Australia, the species is afforded protection through marine park zones throughout several parts of its distribution. It is not targeted for any fishery as a bycatch. It is largely released with likely high survival rates given its general hardiness. Okay, that's actually really cool. Um, so that's cool that this is described to be a hardy species. Um, there have been a couple bycatch studies that uh, sharks that are able to do buccal pumping uh, actually do last longer uh, if they're accidentally caught. Um, and, I, and it makes sense with the species biology. We know that the species can stay out of si outside of water for a while, um, you know, based on its like adaptation from crawling from tipole, like tipole to tipole. Um, I think between buccal pumping and the fact that it can stay outside of water, um, I think that probably lends to its hardiness. So, but it's nice to know that um, it has a lot high, likely high survival rate uh, if it ever is caught in fishing. Uh, there may be some level of take for the aquarium trade. So uh, this is really unfortunate because I did, again, when I was trying to find clips for this species for tonight, um, I did see a lot of uh, private aquarium videos of this shark. And it's just like, I, I, I'm really, I really don't support private aquaria um, for sharks just because it's like, they're... <sighs> They're so large and they're so complicated um, as far as like what they need. Uh, you know, it's just, I, I just don't really support it. You know, just, yeah. Cause like, I mean, yeah, I, I just, I don't think it's a good idea. So, oh, this is interesting. There's some taxonomic uncertainty for this species with evidence suggesting that the Australian form may be a cryptic sister species to the Southeast Asian form. That is cool. Okay. So that is definitely something we got to find out tonight on uh, shark references. Let me let me pull up shark references actually. We definitely got to check that out more. Um, what is it? Chilisculium punctatum. I I'll go back to I uh, Samurai list in a little bit, but it, we definitely got to check that out more if we can. Da da da. -da. Okay, there we go. There we go. Oh, that's a nice illustration, actually. Um, oh, this is the original description. Look at that. Whoa. Sorry, this is kind of a side tangent. Sorry about that. But, like, 
Chili Skin Pontanum by Miller and Onlay in 1838. That is a gorgeous illustration. If that's the original description, that is insane. That is really, really good. Wow. And also, Miller and Onlay, I've been seeing them, like, all around. Um, these are the authors who described the bull shark. Um, when I was uh, prepping with Jess last weekend, uh, we were talking about their involvement with tiger sharks. I think... I don't think they're the authors of Tiger Sharks, but they they did contribute in, uh, in some very early descriptions of Tiger Sharks. So, uh, But yeah, Miller and they are really important names in marine science and uh, fisheries uh, science. So, or not fisheries science, but like fish, fish ichthyology. Ichthyology is, is what I'm trying to say. So, But that that is actually a completely gorgeous illustration. It was really, really cool. So, um, What's nice to uh, see, by the way, is, um, and we saw it in uh, one of the videos earlier, but you can actually see this lovely uh, speckling pattern on this species on top of the uh, alternating bars, um, uh, you know, in, in the main color palette. So I think there was, yeah, this this little clip. You can actually see this in this little clip. There's just like this, this lovely little speckling on top of, uh, <laughs> like, the main color pa uh, pattern for the species, so. It's so cute. <laughs> so yeah, um, and again, just kind of reiterating the placement of the uh, the spherical in relation to the eye is really close. The last two gill slits are very close. It's it's actually that's a really unique arrangement um, as far as like sharks go. So that's actually it's really cool to see that. <laughs> All right. So what was I doing here? I was doing. Oh, I wanted to load up the. Um, just want to get the list of literature references ready so um, if we, uh, we can maybe if hopefully there is like a paper or something about this whole sister species thing um, so just to reiterate uh, there is uncertainty for this species with evidence suggesting that the Australian form may be a cryptic sister species so there could be the southeastern brown banded bamboo shark and the australian brown banded bamboo shark so which i love because as we've said many times on the stream uh there's a lot of sharks hiding in plain sight there's a lot of species that are waiting to be discovered and you know there's only like subtle genetic differences or morphological differences um that haven't really been ironed out yet so that's actually really cool to take a look at later tonight so um this taxon taxonomic uncertainty has implications for the conservation of the species as this may limit the replenishment of exploited populations if they do not receive recruitment from largely unexploited populations let's see based on the ongoing threats to the species from fishing pressure habitat destruction and suspected population declines based on declines in aggregate thai shark landings this shark is assessed globally as near threatened okay so it's a hardy species, but it's in an area that's facing a lot of fishing pressure. Um, in Southeast Asia, it may be vulnerable in the near future as it is likely close to meeting the threshold for that criterion. A key priority is to clarify population reduction and population substructure. In Australia, uh, where mortality for the fisheries is limited, the species is common in some marine protected areas and it's assessed as least concern. So again, we said it before, but go Australia. Thank you for protecting a lot of your um, marine habitat and, um, you know, helping sharks. So, let's see, uh, I won't read the whole conservation actions thing, but this species is protected in a significant proportion of its Australian range on the east coast of Australia in the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park and Moreton Bay Marine Park. Okay. Um, the species is not targeted for fishing, and it's pretty hardy. Let's see. Oh, this is interesting. Restocking of wild populations from captive bred aquaria stock has occurred on one occasion in... Is that fuck it, Thailand? <laughs> Sorry. I... Sorry, apologies. I don't know if I said that right. Phuket, Thailand? which comprise the release of 99 captive brev sharks between nine and 12 months old. Interesting. Interesting, so 
If we have time, I would like to kind of take a look at Great Barrier Reef Marine Park or Morden Bay Marine Park. Um, we'll see what else we can learn about kind of the biology of the species before we dive in further. So, mm -hmm. um, let's see. Do, 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 do. So, Florida Museum, good place to start with like just more of a broad profile. Uh, they hunt at night using sensitive barbels on their snouts to locate crabs, worms, and other small prey. Um, because they are so hardy, able to survive out of water for several hours at time, or several hours at times, they are popular in aquariums. Um, oh, and there's a photo from Doug Perrine. That's another famous uh, marine life photographer. So, all right. Oh, that's so cool. Good. Brahmin and boo shark is important to commercial fisheries in inshore waters of India, Thailand, Singapore, Malaysia, and Philippines. Um, let's see. It is a favorite with home aquarists as well as public aquarium facilities in Australia, Europe, Mexico, Canada, and the United States. The species is also able to reproduce in captivity. Um, I don't think I've ever seen this species in public aquarium. Have you ever seen the species uh, in aquariums in Canada? Um, or the U.S. I don't think I've... I've seen epaulette sharks, but I don't think I've seen this particular... I feel like I haven't seen the species, but I could be wrong. Um, let me double check. Uh, there is one aquarium that's not really well known, but I do want to do a shout out to them. Um, this is Glen Echo Park oh, Aquarium. And this is, they might not have an independent website. Oh, there it is. Maybe they do have Book and Aquarium Visit. Uh, it's a small aquarium, but it's actually really cool. And it's a nice showcase of, oh, Glen Echo Park Aquarium's website. There you go. They do have a website. Um, they might have a brown banded bamboo shark uh, as a teaching shark. Um, that I, I know they have a small shark for... Um, like um, teaching, like 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 teaching about shark biology. Oh, this is actually really cool. <laughs> nice uh, jaw set of. Um, almost looks like. Well, it almost looks like. I want to say it's like a. I don't. I can't tell from the teeth type because that 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 could be a white shark or it could be a meg. But this aquarium is really cool. They're small, but they have actually a really good collection of uh, Chesapeake Bay species, and um, it's a really good team. Um, so, yeah, if you're ever in around the D.C. area uh, or I, the, you know Bethesda, Maryland area, um, they're actually really cool. So, exhibits and creatures. Let's see. Horseshoe crabs, blue crab, spider crab, black crab. Flounder, Remora, and I'm sorry, I won't. I won't spend too much time here. I just, I thought they did have one. Yeah. Okay. So these are all Chesapeake Bay species that they're showcasing. Um, okay. So my mistake. I thought they did have one for like a teaching tool. So, but, um, but yeah. So I've never seen one, as far as I know. Oh, nice call. I uh, just saw your comment, uh, Howard. Uh, great white. So, great white jaw set. Yeah, it was throwing me off because it's like it was so big. Like, whenever I see, you know, like photographs of large jaw sets, like in books and stuff, it's usually Megalodon. So, my instinct was like Megalodon. But then, you know, based on the size and then also like the tooth type, it's like, yeah, that actually could be a white shark. So, good call. I think, I think you're right as far as uh, what kind of species that was. Oh, danger to humans. <laughs> brown banded bamboo shark. Oh man. Considered harmless to humans, brown banded bamboo shark may nip divers if provoked. So, mm -hmm. uh, we talked about conservation. We talked about habitat. Or, sorry, uh, distribution. Uh, habitat. Um, kind of touched on it, but uh, this small tropical shark is commonly found on inshore coral reefs over sandy and muddy bottom habitats ranging from 0 to 85 meters. It is a generally solitary animal with small individuals hiding in crevices of the reefs, well camouflaged with their banding pattern. As a nocturnal feeder, this shark becomes more active at night when it excavates the sediments in search of prey. 
An extremely hardy species of brown banded bamboo shark is often also often observed in tide pools and can tolerate hypoxia for extended periods of time. So as we dive into some research later, this might be interesting to kind of take a look at if we can find a paper. And I actually, um, after we, I might dive in after we go through Florida Museum because like I would, the, the cryptic sister species and then how it can tolerate hypoxia, those would be really cool to kind of learn more about. So let's see, biology, We talked about a lot of this already. Spiracles are located below, behind the eye. Okay. Petition. Okay. Maximum reported size is 104 centimeters, so one meter, so that is about three and a half feet maximum. Adult males reach maturity at 76 centimeters, while females mature at 63 centimeters. The life expectancy of the brown banded bamboo shark is approximately 25 years. So, uh, for a shark of that size, that's actually I feel like, I feel like that's pretty that's pretty that's pretty long lived. So, that's pretty amazing. Amazing. Um, Reproduction is I feel like, I feel like, I wonder, I wonder, get a picture of the egg case, actually, actually. Fish base, fish base. Oh, there we go. Yeah, here we go. Can you see that? Is this broken? Mm. Uh, <laughs> that looks really cool. Um, that might be broken somehow. Uh, Okay, well, I'll, I'll just zoom in on this, so, you know, because I, I don't know what's going on there, but, um, but this is, uh, pretty, uh, pretty rounded, pretty simple egg, uh, egg case, because, um, you think about, like, uh, cat sharks, uh, the egg case is a lot more elongate, uh, horn sharks, the egg case is actually very, um, it's that corkscrew, like, very iconic corkscrew shape, so, like, bullhead sharks have the iconic corkscrew shape. Um, this is... Pretty simple looking, um, even simpler than a mermaid's purse, which is a, um, a skate egg case. So, let's see, maybe we can get some more pictures of that cute little face. Let's see. The embryos feed entirely in the yolk within the egg case until they hatch and become free swimming. In captivity, it could take up to four months after being released from the female for hatching to occur. The young bamboo shark measures 13 to the 17 centimeters total length upon hatching. Uh, predators of the brown band bamboo shark include larger fish, such as sharks, as well as marine mammals. The genus name Chiloscilium is derived from the Greek chilios, meaning lip, and scila defined as a kind of shark. So, let's see, fish base is usually pretty good with the Latin names. So, chilios lip referring to the membranous and brown, a broad lower lip, presumably of um, C. plagiosum, Provost Bile species. Scilion, Greek for dogfish or small shark. So it's like, a small shark with lips, <laughs> which is kind of funny. Uh, punctatum, Latin for spotted, referring to the scattering of small blackish spots on young specimens. Interesting. Okay, let's take a look at some research because I do, again, I do want to figure out more about like that hypoxia scenario, like how long they can survive out of water and 
maybe some studies. Um, before we do that, I did want to take a quick look at um, this caught my eye. This is uh, USGS, the United States Geological Survey. And I thought it was very odd that this species showed up on this because it's like this is a very, you know, this is a Pacific species. This is a, a tropical Pacific species that is nowhere near the United States, except uh, apparently there was an individual that was found in Florida as an invasive species. Uh, it was observed and photographed near uh, Riviera Beach in 2007. So that kind of caught my eye. Um, means of introduction, probable aquarium release. Impact of introduction, currently unknown. Um, probably not the worst thing in the world, but at the same time, it's like, it's kind of shocking that, wow, this specific species was introduced uh, in Florida waters. So, um, oh, shoot, I'm sorry. Uh, can you hear me now? Uh, I just noticed a comment on audio fuzz. So make sure I'm coming in okay. It's probably because I've been clicking around with it, um, back and forth with fish base in the photos, so. Um, let's see. And it's probably that website. Uh, there, there's a really cool website with like, um, I forget the name of that aquarium, but um, the, uh, the website that had the A case picture, so. <laughs> Let's see. Oh, thank you. Awesome. Audio good. So, all right. So let's, uh, so I think, I think this is pretty interesting. I, I assume this is a one time thing. Oh, chili skin and punctatum with unusual throat swelling. Oh no. I, I wonder what that is. Um, let's see. I just want to see if there's any information on that. So I was just going to say, um, it make, again, since the shark is so popular in private aquariums that, um, you know, it makes sense that maybe some guy, and I think someone told me Florida is maybe the worst state as far as um, people having exotic pets and introducing them into the wild. Um, the Everglades have a lot of animals that shouldn't be there uh, because people just introduce them into the wild. Like there's like weird, I mean like there's like weird uh, like snakes and like crocodiles and things that are just like they shouldn't really be there. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm talking like extreme, like I think somebody told me there was like a different kind of crocodile, not the American crocodile, but like a different kind of crocodile that was in the Everglades. It's like, yeah, yeah, that's that's not where it's supposed to be. Point is, um, you know, it doesn't surprise me that maybe somebody had a had this species in their collection and it outgrew whatever setup they had, or maybe they were moving and so they decided to release in the wild, which is not good. Um, if any person who may be watching this. Um, you know, in the future, like, is in a situation where they need to release an animal, uh, don't do that. Just give it to an aquarium or uh, a zoo or something, you know, because I'm sure, you know, somebody would love to take on a critter that's exotic in their collection, and please do not introduce things into the wild because they actually can cause damage or they can actually introduce things to that habitat that the, the natural habitat or the natural environment is not really used to. Um, as far as this species is concerned, I mean, there's not really any other kind of shark like this in Florida or the tropical Atlantic, so it's not good if they're introduced into the wild because there's nothing else that really has that niche. But I also kind of feel like if it's just one individual, it probably was quickly, hopefully, eaten by a different shark. So, but yeah, so I'm assuming this is a one-time thing, but... Uh, it caught my eye, though, that uh, I, I never heard of that, um, a tropical Pacific shark being introduced to an Atlantic environment, so it's pretty interesting. So, But anyway, let's take a look at some studies that have been done on this species. Da, 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 da. It's almost 10 o'clock, and there is no thunder whatsoever. I, I, I don't know why my city freaks out at nothing. I don't, I don't understand, but... 
Mm. This might be cool. Uh, advancing DNA barcoding to elucidate elasmic biodiversity in Malaysian waters. Let's check that out. Oh. Open with system viewer. Nope, that's not what I want. Sorry, hold on. No, 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 no. I want... Hold on. I want this. There we go. Sorry, this is what I wanted. Okay. Let's see what this is. Because I'm curious if they're going to talk about maybe that whole sister species thing. I'm wondering if this study might have that. So. <laughs> Okay, what? So I'm just going to scan through this because I don't know if this will have something that we can maybe chew into tonight. But um, kind of the thing that kind of caught my eye, which is pretty interesting, is um, uh, da, 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 da. so this is a genetic study on species in Malaysia. Um, and in this study, they uh, confirmed that there's a couple new the shark species that haven't been recorded in Malaysia. Um, that are now on the list. So Squalus edmundsi is a kind of dogfish. Carcharhinus amboinensis is the... Is that the silver tip shark? Let me look that up, actually. I should know that one. Uh, Alopia superciliosis, the big eye thresher. And Myliobatis hamlini, which is some kind of ray. Um, I really should know what Carcharhinus amboinensis is. That is... The pig eye shark. Never mind, the pig eye shark. That actually, that one actually looks weirdly like a bull shark in a lot of ways. But anyway, so, and they're talking about um, genetic distances among um, these different kinds of species, which might, might be kind of cool to see if they have like a cool graph on that. So I'm just going to scan through this really quickly um, and also just control find our bamboo shark just to see if we can find something kind of cool. And if it's like two nuts, <laughs> we 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 won't we won't spend a lot of time here. But hmm. If I'm getting, going kind of fast, it's just because they're rays, and I'm just, um, here's some sharks, here's sharks, right here. Um, no offense to rays, rays are awesome. Like, ray, ray, rays are legitimately awesome. I, uh, I'm just not a ray guy, but, or I'm not as much a ray guy as a shark guy. Well... Okay, here's the group of that includes our bamboo shark, Chiliscillium punctatum. Yeah, I I don't know. Yeah, I, I don't know. This might be not kind of like what I'm really looking for. So. Okay, that's not working the way I want it to work. Can I... Is there a place I can just... Okay. We'll just keep going. Yeah, 
Yeah, this might not have something new. And I know I'm just scanning it, but it might not have... This is interesting, sorry, this is really catching my eye. Uh, this has nothing to do with our bamboo shark, but this kind of caught my eye. The use of barcoding approaches is also fundamental, so this is a DNA, oh, sorry, a DNA technique. Um, the barcoding approaches is also fundamental in describing species that are still unknown to the scientific communities. This is important to prevent the loss of species before even being discovered, as seen in Carcharhinus obsolerivus? What is that? Uh, let's kind of go on an adventure. The Lost Shark. I, okay, so I've heard of Lost Shark, but I don't know... No, wait. No, 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 no. No, 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 no. Is this the same thing? Is this a typo? Car Hold on. I've heard of Lost Shark before, but... What? Wait a minute. A new species of whale or shark, Carcharhinus obsolerus from the Western Central Pacific, known only from historic records, 2019. What? I've heard of... Oh, we definitely gotta check this out. I've never heard- wait a minute. I've heard of Lost Shark, Carcharhinus obsoletus, but this might be something different. So, let's check this out. Carcharhinus obsolerus is described based on three specimens from Borneo, Thailand, and Vietnam in the western central Pacific. It belongs to the uh, porosis subgroup, which is characterized by having the second dorsal fin insertion opposite the anal fin midbase. So Carcharis porosis, I think it's a night shark. Um, so it's a smaller kind of uh, requiem shark. It most closely resembles Carcharis borne uh, borneensis, but differs in tooth morphology and counts in a number of morphological characters, including lack of enlarged hyomandibular pores, which are a diagnostic of Carcharis borneensis. The historic range of C. obsolerus sp. nov, so this is a little indicator that this is a new species, is under intense fishing pressure, and this species has not been recorded anywhere in over 80 years. There is an urgent need to assess its extinction risk status for the ISM red list of threatened species. With so few known records, there is a possibility that Carcharhinus obsolerus has been lost from the marine environment before any understanding could be gained of its full historic distribution, biology, ecosystem role, and importance in local fisheries. So that's kind of wild. Um, it's not, is this not the same thing as, uh, Carcharhinus obsoletus? Is this different? Wow. Um, has anybody heard of this? Like, uh, let's see. Oh, cool. Sorry, Howard. I just saw your comment. I collect ray and holocephalon material as well as shark. That's actually, that's, that's really awesome. Cause it's like, um, I mean, like, just having like that full spectrum of Elasma ranks, I mean, it's that is actually really really cool. Um, I have a couple ray plates. I do have a couple fossil ray plates. So, um, and then I just saw your comment. Nope. So yeah, I have. This is really kind of throwing me off because I've I've definitely heard of Carcharhinus obsoletus, but this is and I don't know if this is like a weird. This is the one I've heard of. Carcharhinus obsoletus. But that is so similar to like what this is being called, Carcharhinus obsolerus. Obsolerus, sorry, obsolerus. There we go. I thought I thought I was saying this wrong. Carcharhinus obsolerus. That is so similar. Uh, let's check out IUCN. I don't know if this is like a weird typo thing or. So 
Sorry, I do I do love the side tangent, like the side quests um, on the stream. Uh, okay, this is Carcharanus obsoletus. Obsolaris. Classified as critically endangered. I've definitely heard of this species. Um, man, but what about... I, I, I'm, this might, I wonder if this is the same thing. I don't know. Let's, let's keep reading, because I'm kind of curious about this. actually a really beautiful tooth right there um, no actually wait that was actually a really cool that's actually a really cool um, like scan of just the chondrocranium and how it interacts with the jaw because um, like rarely you can actually if, if you see like kind of like a uh, you, I, you can see this on the beach sometimes. It's it's really not common because it is cartilage and it's so easily damaged. Um, like it could become so easily damaged, but you can actually see the chondrocranium wash up sometimes, and it's just it's interesting to see like it, this red area how it connects to the eyes and the jaw, um, like or where it is in relation to the eyes and the jaw. It's an interesting scan. So. Uh, um, okay. Uh, William White, Peter Kine, Mark Harris. Oh, do you know what? I think this is the same species. Okay. Kine, White. Okay, yeah. This might be the same species. Okay. So sorry, that really threw me off. They might have. What might have happened is that they actually might have started with Obsolaris and then they renamed it Obsoletus. Um, and I like obsoletus better. Let's see. Okay, yeah. Uh, last specimen collected in 1834. So this is this is actually the. This is actually, okay, I, I do know the species. Sorry, that really threw me off for a second. Okay, so this actually, someday uh, soon, I know we're gonna do tiger sharks next week, but lost shark would be a really good one to talk about someday um, because like, it's probably the one that is closest to extinction and may already be, I, I, I don't know, I don't know. I mean, cause there have been cases of sharks that were thought to be extinct and they reappeared, um, like in fisheries markets. Um, so, I don't know. This will be a good one to do someday. Uh, next week we'll do the tiger shark, but um, maybe maybe the stream after, if, if, if anyone's interested, lost shark would be a good one to do. Um, so, sorry about that. Sorry about that side tangent. Just like that article really threw me off and just the name, I didn't recognize the name at first. So, that was pretty interesting. So, sorry about that. All right, let's go back to research. So I don't think we're seeing anything unique about our our bamboo shark in this. So we'll go back to the main page and see if we can find some more oops, sorry, articles. Sexual dimorphism. This might be interesting, cranial morphology of the bamboo shark, or brown banded bamboo shark. Here we go, this is actually really cool because this this is specif this is just zoning in on our species um, specifically, so. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, elasmobranchs comprising sharks, skates, and rays have a long evolutionary history extending back to the into the uh, Paleozoic. They are characterized by un various unique traits, including a predominantly cartilaginous skeleton, uh, superficial prismatic phosphatic layer. I have not heard of that before. That's actually really cool. And permanent tooth replacement. That's actually a really cool feature. Um, that like, that's not talked about. Uh, it, this is interesting. Uh, that's not as talked about as much as it should be. Because um, I know, I think in pop culture, we do talk about tooth replacement quite a lot. Like sharks are very famous for like, you know, it's like that's like a very popular fact in like elementary school or middle school where it's like, yeah, sharks are able to grow their teeth throughout their lifetime, blah, blah, blah. But I think it's kind of not as well known that this is a really important feature that distinguishes sharks from other animals, like sharks as a group. Um, that permanent tooth replacement is something that is actually unique to sharks um, or is unique to this line of animals. So um, it's been a while since I've seen that as an identifier of Slackians. Um, so I, I just wanted to uh, point that out because that is actually, it, it, I, I feel like it's one of those things that kind of like fades into the background of like, oh yeah, by the way, this is something really important to this group or this is something that defines this group is like, like this is actually a definitive characteristic. So um, moreover, they exhibit a more or less marked sexual dimorphism, especially the morphology of the chondrocranium and the elements of the whole cranial region. An extant and extinct chondrichthians can provide valuable information about corresponding functions. Whoa, wait a minute. Especially the morphology of the chondrocranium and the elements of the whole... I've never heard of that. Uh, so sharks do have sexual dimorphism, but I never heard of the, like, the cranium, like the head being a part of that. So this is going to be interesting. Let's check this out. Um, uh, for this reason, we present in this study a comprehensive morphological description of the cranial region of the brown banded bamboo shark with a special focus on its sexual dimorphic characters. Our results reveal clear morphological differences in both sexes of the examined um, bamboo shark specimens, particularly in the contracranium and the mandibular arch. The female specimen shows a comparatively more robust and compact morphology of the contracranium. This pattern is also evident in the mandibular arch, especially in the plato quadrate. I think that's the lower part of the jaw. We'll find out because there probably is going to be a diagram later. The present study is the first to describe the morphology of an electrolobal shark species in detail using both manual dissection and micro CT data. Oh, this is going to be cool. I think that means there should be a scan. Okay. The resulting data furthermore provides a starting point for pending studies and are intended to be a first step in a series of comp comparative studies on the morphology of the cranial region of or electrolobal sharks, including the uh, determination of possible sexual dimorphic characteristics. Okay, I've never heard of that before, and this is really exciting. Uh, this is by uh, Manuel Andreas Stagel, Daniel Abed Navandi, Jurgen Krewet, um, in vertebrate zoology. So, this is going to be really interesting. So, let's go to. I'd like to see some visuals. Oh, here we go. Here we go. Okay. I just make sure I didn't skip anything. Okay. Okay, so this is a male brown band and bamboo shark. Oh. He has a very squished face. This is a very, a very adorable shark. It's actually interesting uh, that it's like the mouth and the um, the barbel, the mouth and the snout and the barbels are very compact together, and the eye and the spiracle is very compact together. And then there's so much space um, before you get to the gills um, and the uh, pectoral fins. So it's, this is a very, it is a, it is a pretty uh, unique looking group. And then here is the female. Okay. Female, male. Hmm. 
This is going to be really tricky. I mean, just, just a, on a visual level, this is going to be really tricky because these are preserved specimens, so... Um, so that's going to be really tricky, but I, I, I definitely think it's worth a try anyway to see if we could spot differences. So, if I'm understanding this correctly, it does look like the head is a bit more robust, but again, this is like almost impossible to do, probably just visually. Because you also have to wonder like how much of this is to do with the size of the species? And, and um, preservation status? I don't know. I, I, I don't know. Uh, let's see what we're supposed to see. But either way, like it is actually really cool. I've never heard of because um, I, we, you know, there's definitely this sexual dimorphism in that you know, sh female sharks are larger. Um, some sharks have like, like male sharks have like thorny fins. Females have smooth fins. Um, the big one is males have claspers. Females don't have claspers. But I've never heard of the cr the actual the chondrocranium, like the head being uh, any different. So that's actually really fascinating uh, I don't really want to click on a dissected specimen I think just to maybe get the best oh here we go okay this is a male chondrocranium wow this is Kind of wild. Yikes, okay. Okay, and we'll put this over with the male shark. And we're gonna see. Yeah, I don't want to see it dissected. Here's the female chondrocranium. Female, male. Um. This is tricky because again, um, you gotta be careful of how much of this is affected by um, preservation. You could definitely see a difference in shape, but um, hmm, like for example, um, I mean, in the female shark, um, this is looking, this region, the HMF uh, region over here is looking a bit more pronounced. In the male shark, this is not as developed. And again, I gotta be really careful, like down here, uh, this is looking a bit thicker. It's not as developed in the male. I don't know. Um, so Howard, since you do uh, work with a lot of fossils, are you seeing any, because again, this is really tricky with like um, you know, how much of this is like being affected by, the, I mean, this looks like a really good scan, but do you see any major like differences that are really catching your eye? Cause it does, it does look different. Um, and I don't know what the standard deviation of difference would be. So, oh, what type of scan is that? Uh, this is a, did it say it was a CT scan? What do they, what, what is this? Results, methods, CT scans, uh, high resolution, a micro CT device. Uh, both specimens were scanned with um, Viscom, I have no idea what this is, but a Viscom NDT micro CT device. 
to obtain high resolution, high resolution CT scans. So micro CT scan, scans or CT scans processed with Amira software. Interesting. I wonder, um, I'll, I'll skip ahead. I'll keep those open, but I'll, I'll skip ahead to see if there's like a side by side so they can actually really elucidate what's different. Sorry, I'm really going too fast on this. Okay, this is kind of cool. Um, since I kind of colorized it. Okay. So female olfactory uh, sacs, and then male olfactory sacs. They do look different. Like um, males, like more, it, like this is looking a lot more like rounded and compact. Uh, this is more ang ang angled on females. I mean, the fact that we're even trying to do this, like, like on a crash course of a stream, I mean, it's kind of, it's kind of wild, because this is such an intricate study, but, um, I want to go back to the skull really quick, or, sorry, the chondrocranium really quick, um, just to get a different view. Uh, this would be, uh, this would be kind of a cool view. Um, this is the female, this is the male. Uh, that looks kind of similar. Oh! Actually, no, look at that! Um, this AOP region right here, um, it is a bit more pronounced than the female. And the male, it's a bit smaller. This is really interesting. Uh, Howard, uh, fossil cartilage is very rare. I do see differences, however. Unlike bone cartilage is highly flexible, distorts easily. I couldn't provide an informed opinion on those images. That, I mean, that's a, that's a good point. And I, I didn't think about the deformity or the risk of deformity. So that's a really, really good point. Um, yeah, I think we should probably zoom uh, forward to the discussion. Um, I think the last thing... I wonder if it's safe to say um, this POP region in the male, uh, or in uh, the POP region in the female is a lot more pronounced than in the male. So, but again, that's a really good point that because it is cartilage, how much of this can be distorted? Um, my my gut feeling, based on like the study and based on just kind of flipping back and forth between these images, is that I do think there are differences. I I I, I can kind of see subtle differences, but. Um, but, you know, like you said, I mean, it's, it's just like, it's so, like, this is such a, I mean, this is such a complicated study, uh, and it's actually a really cool study, but it's, it's so complicated that um, it's, it's kind of, like, wild, wild to even attempt, like, trying to find differences um, on the stream. So let's go ahead uh, to the discussion, and Although I actually do want to open like a CT scan just of the jaw, just just to kind of look look at the looking at how the jaw works. So not not to find differences, but just to kind of see. This is cool. So MC, um, I know that's Meckel's cartilage. So I'm slowly slowly learning shark anatomy. So that's the I believe it's a lower jaw. It's a cool scan. No oh, man, sharks are so cool. I mean, it's just like I, I, I just, I mean, like, look how neatly folded that is. You know, it's just like, like this, this, such, like, like this. It's so it's such a complex mechanism, and it's just like so tucked in. You know, it's so cool. Okay.
Well, this is this this is a wild study. This is this is pretty crazy. Uh, I, re I really, uh, I really don't want to pull up some of the anatomy photos because I, you know, I, I don't, I don't want to go too much into the anatomy. But um, damn, they, wow, they looked at a lot. This is a really robust study. Look how big this is. <laughs> like, oh my, wow, they really did. Like, they're looking at muscle tissue. They're looking at jaws. This is insane. I mean, not insane. It's actually the opposite. It's it's very sane. It's robustly sane. It is. They're, they're doing a lot. All right. I just want to get to the. Oh, here we go. Discussion. Here we go. Hey, uh, this is exactly what you said, Howard. Look at this. Uh, the skeleton of the chondrichthyans consists of cartilage, which is difficult to distinguish from the surrounding soft tissues using micro CT scans. So bravo, because it's. It, it's cool to see that they're acknowledging, like, yeah, because it's cartilage, that presents another layer of difficulty. You know, it, like, there's there's a little bit of a degree of unreliability with that. So... Do, 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 do. Then I'm just going to scan through this. Oh, and here we go. Yeah, I mean, when I used to work in a fisheries lab, this, this is a very important thing. A persistent problem with staining objects preserved in ethanol is that the tissue dehydrates and thus shrinks relatively quickly when the object is stained in aqueous iodine solution. So preservatives absolutely distort, um, you know, your specimen, and you, you do get a like emaciated, shriveled version of what this actually is. So. But, uh, All right, so I think they're just... Here we go, morphological discussion. This is cool. Um, okay, so brown band and bamboo shark lives mainly in and around coral reefs, intertidal pools, flat water zones, and reef walls. Um, as highly multi-layered habitats, coral reefs clearly represent the definition of an n-dimensional hypervolume. Uh, bamboo sharks are highly adapted to these conditions. Their flat, elongated shape allows them to live in such intricate habitats as they can fit through small openings in the reef and move with great maneuverability. With their wide, shovel-like rostrum, they are also able to move objects, such as stones or pieces of coral, around to reach food. Um, the streamlined rostrum also makes it easier for them to search for prey deeper in the substrate. Um, and that makes sense because it feeds on bottom dwelling invertebrates and possibly small fishes. I know they, um, I think Florida Museum mentioned that they feed on worms, you know, buried in the substrate, so. Oh! Uh, according to Wilga et al., the closely related species Chiloscillium plagiosum is an obligate suction feeder. So that's really cool. Uh, due to the very similar morphology, the close relationship of both species and observations of their feeding behavior made in situ, the species studied here uh, can also be considered an obligate suction feeder. So that's awesome. That is a lot like nurse sharks where they're able to vacuum prey, um, you know, just, just from hard to reach places in coral reef environments. Um, and it's actually, again, it's really cool knowing that um, it's like an extreme version of buccal pumping, you know, buccal pumping sharks actively pumping water over their gills. These kinds of carpet sharks, you know, take that to the next level to literally suck prey into their mouths. So it's super cool. Uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. Uh, the animals often dig for prey in the soft substrate. In doing so, the animals invade the sediment up to the f level of the first gill slit and dig for invertebrates with a combination of suction and head movements. The prey consequently is sucked into the oral cavity and the sand is expelled through the spiracles and especially the rearmost two gill slits. Oh my gosh, look at that. So that might be why those two gill slits look so weird. Like, like you know, like we just, we talked about that at the, at the top of the stream. Like, you know, you, uh, Howard, you mentioned that the, the rearmost two gills, like, are such a weird position, they're weirdly close to each other. This is really cool, but this might be an, a, a, an adaptation 
uh, and, uh, as, as a way to expel sand, sand uh, as, as the truck, truck is actually eating. Um, that, that is, is extremely, extremely cool. cool. Wow. wow. And, and it makes sense, sense that, that uh, 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 sharks, sharks have a similar feature because sharks are sharks do the same way thing. So that is awesome. As for bone sharks, I don't know what that would be about. Because it could be that the bone sharks are sharks and also of the carpet sharks. So, you know, you know. Maybe it's, maybe it's, it's, it's sort of like, sort of like a, a, what do you call that? Uh, I don't know if it's uh, residual to it, but maybe, it, maybe it's like, like, you know, you know just, just because they're closely related, it's not really a functional thing. I don't know. We'll, we'll, we'll have to we'll we'll go into that when we we'll get to whale we'll sharks. But, but this is awesome. This is awesome. I was not I expecting to learn that in this paper, so that's really cool. Um, to make this type of feeding feasible, a water mass in front of the predator's mouth has to be moved into the mouth. This has to happen fast enough in order, together with the viscosity of the water, to prevent the prey from escaping. If suction takes place close to any substrate, preferably solid, this can extend the distance of the suction effect as a volume of water has to be moved, regardless of the spatial orientation of the same. Also helpful here is a dorsally located rostrum, which uh, favors a precise direction of the sus suction jet. Oh, this is so cool. Oh, hey, they talk about nurse sharks, too. Uh, this is so cool. The nurse shark uh, has an, ex an effective sucking distance of only about three centimeters in front of the mouth, and due to the exponential decrease in effective sucking distance, these animals are probably not very effective active predators, but have to approach a prey, ambush them, or restrict themselves to sessile or slow prey. Oh, this is so cool. Nurse and bamboo sharks are sometimes very similar in their feeding behaviors, which is why a similar hunting behavior can be assumed for our bamboo shark, uh, Chilisculium punctatum. So cool. Okay, now they're getting into details about how that suction uh, works. Let me double check on the comments. Uh, Howard, I concur. Uh, there are apparent differences. I would have to first see a number of male specimens to see individual variation, and you would also have to rule out morphological differences due to ontogeny. Good call. Good call. Um, and I'm sorry about I, I just saw the audio, so it looks like it's okay now. So thank you. Uh, sorry about that. There, I got I got so excited. I got really caught up in um, like I ah, this is such a cool surprise because um, I thought this was going to be a very narrow study and this is actually giving us a lot of cool information just in general about the species so this is super cool i love i love it i love surprises like that um on these streams like didn't didn't expect to do this but let's see do, 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 do. Uh, so just phoenix. This is getting into detail, more detail. Okay, this is more detail, like anatomy detail. So I won't read it out loud. I'm just scanning it for some cool, you know, tidbits of information. And the music might have died. Oh yeah, yeah, go for it. Sorry about that. Oh, okay, here we go. Okay, two pectoral fins attached to the shoulder girdle. These are special in uh, our uh, Chiliscillium, insofar as similar to Hemiscillium. So Chiliscillium is our brown banded bamboo shark. Hemiscillium is the epaulette shark. This shark uses them to f uh, f use them far more diverse diversely. I can't speak than many other shark species. Um, typically, these two genera use a relatively flexible pectoral and pelvic fins to rest on them on the substrate and to move by performing a primitive crawl, rarely even above water. This is cool. Let's talk about the anatomy of how that works. The 
These seem to be distinctly different from those of pelagic sharks, which use the fins mainly for maneuvering. Um, bamboo sharks probably rely more on maneuverability than on the stable water position. In doing so, they use the principle of lifting wings to create vortices, which locally generate a partial negative pressure in the median and give the animal lift or down force. This is also the case when the animals rest on the substrate. Interesting. Okay, so I forget which stream this was, but um, this was what I was talking about, and I, I really butchered it, but how each shark's fin, um, each, each of the shark's fins, like, it has an effect on the water, and, you know, like it's saying creating vortices, or it's talking about creating eddies, like, et, like, like, the shape of a shark's fins are is very very purposeful. It's it, it, it creates a, such a unique um, space in the water um, that it affects like the phys the physics of that unique uh, that individual species. So like the like like no feature is um, how do I say this? It's like like there's no feature that's like really accidental as far as like you know the proportion of the shark the, the the size of the shark fins the shape of the shark's fins where it is on the body you know the proportions in relation to like the rest of the body it, it's a unique kind of movement you know each it, it, it's in it, 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 and this is saying it a lot better than i was and i i still have uh, kind of struggle saying it but like um this is what i was trying to talk about where it's like the shape of the fins creates a unique cut in the water um, that kind of helps with locomotion. So, or a unique pocket in the water, or like they're saying, an eddy or a vorticing in the water. So, da, 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 da. especially in currents due to swell tides, this is to the advantage of the habitat. Um, usually, the fins are placed concave upward and thus additionally pressed against the substrate by eddies. Uh, depending on the intensity of the current, the animals stand more or less erected. The stronger the current, the more acute the angle of the bottom seems to be. Thus, the behavioral observations and morphology study match the study of... Yeah, sorry. I was kind of reading that to myself, but this is super cool. Because all, all this information is, like, really, really cool, um, is supporting, supporting like, the meat of this, which is just, like, the, the anatomy of the species, and this, ultimately, like, how the male is different than the female. But this background is, is really valuable information. So. Okay, here we go. The sexes differ morphologically in only a few aspects according to results of the study. Most visible are differences in the shape of the head, the chondrocranium, and the mandibular arch. In dorsal view, the male specimen is much broader, especially in the middle posterior region of the head. Okay. Mating is probably induced after initial courtship behavior by the male by biting into the female's pectoral fin. In other species, after briefly continuing to swim parallel, both sexes take up a vertical position facing downwards. This is described for several shark species, some of them very closely related to the bamboo shark. So nurse sharks, uh, white tip reef sharks, hemiskelium, I don't know what this one is, but this is related to the epaulette shark. And another... Um, bamboo shark, uh, mate in a horizontal position. Hmm. Uh, the cons uh, consensus is that the male has to fixate the female in all positions, which takes place, as mentioned before, but by into the pectoral fins. The different morphologies of the male chondrocranium and the male jaw probably present adaptations to this behavior. Interesting. Uh, upper jaw in males is different from females. This could be helping it during mating if it is taking the female's fin and it's, um, or if it's, if the male now takes the pectoral fin of the female into its mouth, it could use the extension to hold the anterior edge of the fin in place. Interesting. So the jaws may be evolved in a certain way in males for mating. So, interesting. Um, 
However, this is just an I, I hypothesis. As, a, as the available data on how females fix by body in the pectoral fin seems to be rare, this process remains merely a hypothesis based on morphological features described herein. Hmm. Okay, I'm hearing a little bit of thunder a little bit outside, but... This is a really cool study. Okay. I just saw your comment, makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah they... Oh, actually, ooh, that reminds me, sorry. Um, uh, Jess and I are signing up to stream a little differently for next week. So, I just want to double check. Okay, cool. Alright, because I think how the setup we're going to do next week, um, I have to keep an eye on comments in a different tab, or in a different view, like on my phone, so, sorry, that was, that was something I meant to do, so we're good. Sorry about that, uh, don't mind me. <laughs> um, let's see. Do, 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 do. Oh, this is actually kind of cool. Okay, so I do want to point this out. Um, this this was months ago, um, but I, I don't know if you remember we were talking about squalomorphs and galeomorphs. Um, those are the two major groups of sharks. So, and there's a couple of different features that distinguish them. But um, they do talk about one of these, uh, and it is something to do with the jaws. So let's, I do want to read this out loud. So, Chile scale and Patagum belongs to the Erlectolobiform sharks, which in turn are a member of the Galeomorph sharks. Um, so, Galeomorphs are heterodontiforms, the bullhead sharks, lamniforms, the mackerel sharks, and carcarhinoforms, the, I hate that they're called ground sharks, but like, you know, requiem sharks, cat sharks. And then Orlectoloba forms a carpet shark. So these are all Galeomorphs, uh, which are considered monophyletic, meaning it's like one group, one closely related group. They are more closely related to each other than any other kind of shark. Um, so this monof monophyly is based, among other things, on the fact that in Galeomorphy, um, the M. levador labii, I don't know what that is, but it's a muscle is directly connected to the neurocranium and not through a tendon in a basal representatives of the squaliomorphy. So, I don't know off the top of my head exactly what this is, but I do know that this is the feature that separates, that basically splits sharks in half um, as far as phylogeny goes. So this is one adaptation that the galeomorphs have that is unique um, from the squaliomorphs. So squaliomorphs being angel sharks, dogfish sharks, uh, cow sharks, frill sharks, bramble sharks, um, saw sharks. So, pretty interesting. So, I just want to do a shout out to that. Um, do, 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 do. More anatomy. Hmm. It's kind of a cool little thing. Do you want to say this out loud? Um, they're talking about eyesight. In general, due to the natural habitat of our bamboo shark, one can conclude that the sense of sight is well developed in shallow waters, which expose to a high light flux and plays an important role in hunting. However, since the animals prefer to be active at dusk or even night, this hypothesis can be rejected. So, interesting. Um, behavioral observations show that the animals hardly hunt visually, but rely primarily on their other senses, especially the sense of smell. So it's actually kind of cool uh, let's take that piece of information with the very first video with what this little guy is doing. 
Um, because I, I thought it was really interesting how attentive he was to, like, the rocks that he was navigating. You know. I think that tracks. I do think that lines up. He seems very, I mean, like, he's pausing, you know, almost with every step. Um, and checking, um, you know, each little crevice here, so. So, maybe this is possibly hunting behavior. You know, as far as the shark checking underneath the crevices. This is a cute and complex animal. Uh, let's see. Um, I'll keep going through this a little bit, then we might have to wind down uh, in a little bit, because I am sort of hearing thunder, uh, and we're getting close to 11 anyway. Sense of smell seems to be even more important when considering the habitat in which the animals live. Smell can uh, smells can travel very far in water. The reef, as a complex structure of crevices, channels, and open passages, has the effect that such olfactoric stimuli are channeled and can be targeted via the animal's stereo perception. <clears throat> the shark can even easily detect prey buried in the sand through its sense of smell, as experiments conducted by the first author have shown. Oh, this is cool. Uh, an ear that is strongly adapted for hearing prey appears to be to provide a selective advantage, for example, for carcharinids. Sharks do not have a pressure displacement transducer in the inner ear, but are presumably only capable of perceiving the displacement components of acoustic waves as stimuli. Uh, nevertheless, various studies have shown that sharks are in principle capable of semi-directional hearing. Wait, this is an oh my gosh, this is an amazing study. This is definitely the this is like it's like a book, but it's it's I mean it's it's pretty fantastic. This is all background for like sexual dimorphism for this one species, but it's 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 actually really helpful. But I definitely did just hear thunder just now. So, um, and we're kind of at the conclusion. Um, so this study is the first to describe the morphology of an electrolobiform shark species in detail using both manual dissection and micro CT data. It has been done with particular attention to possible morphological differences between male and female specimens to establish possible sexual dimorphic patterns. Um, it's dimorphic differences between the sexes can be observed in the specimens investigated. So that's just the biggest point, is that the males and the females are observably different as far as this bamboo shark um, goes. But I think as far as like just a general takeaway, we learned a lot about um, just the biology of the species in, in really nice detail. And specifically, my favorite thing is just why are the back two... Um, gills uh, so close together and so different um, compared to other sharks and I think that makes sense as far as it's a vacuum you know this helps it expel sand as it's vacuuming prey um, from its um, coral reef uh, habitat so this was super cool uh, thank you again um, to these authors uh, Manuel Andreas Stagel, Daniel Abed Navandi and Jurgen Krewet this is from Vertebrate Zoology, the cranial morphology of the Erlectolobiform shark, Chiliscillium punctatum, Miller-Anlay, 1838. This is a super cool study, so, and that provided a heck of a lot of information on this species. So, we're gonna get out of here, and I think we're gonna wrap up. I do wanna end on just this video as, as some background, so, but uh, yeah. So yeah, uh, I just want to comment. Interesting session. Yeah, this was this was an odd one because it's like um, you got some cute footage. We got some really. I mean, it's a really pretty shark, and it kind of started out like uh, you know, a little bit of information on the species, and then sidebar to the lost shark, 
And then we actually learned a lot about its biology and we kind of, you know, got a nice deeper look in terms of like why it looks like the way it looks like and how it interacts with its environment. And it's actually a very complicated animal. So this was super cool. So thank you so much for watching. Uh, next week is going to be extremely exciting. Jess will be here and uh, it will be our second ever um, uh, guest star stream. And we're going to be talking about the extremely charismatic tiger shark. So, um, so we'll be doing that next week. And then the week after, we're going to launch our biggest contest yet. Uh, so we're definitely going to do a major uh, art contest with prizes uh, in relation and celebration uh, in relation to and celebration of Shark Week. So, but thank you so much for watching. Uh, thank you, especially Howard, for uh, being here tonight and for uh, your awesome artwork. I hope you have a really great rest of your week. And uh, cheers to the brown banded bamboo shark. So, we'll see you next week for Tiger Sharks with Jess Myers. Can't wait. This is gonna be super super cool. But thanks again for watching. Hope you have a really good rest of your week. Cheers.